So today we have the pleasure of having Dr. Uh, Titoho here that will talk about PET instrumentation flow and the brain scanner project. So thank you very much. Uh, so before I go into the presentation, I wanted to know who in this room know about positron emission tomography? Okay, that's, that's a good number, good. And also we do that here, so that's a good sign. Um, other question, who actually works in the field using these devices? Okay, a few hands. And how many of you build machines that are used for the imaging? Oh, there you go. Hey. All right, so that means uh, this is probably gonna be interesting for you guys because the goal of this is to figure out how these machines actually work inside. So just an overview. So uh, most of you know this, right? So we have a tracer inside a patient, and then there's a hotspot somewhere, and that's where all the post comes from, and we get a pair of collinear gammas, and that's how you get some sort of idea of where the radio tracer went in the body. And this is what you want to figure out uh, when you're doing your experiment. So you wait a while, and you get many of these, and then you go through the imagery construction engine, and you get a nice picture. So you can do your study, you can know where your tracer went, you can know if you cured the disease, you can do all sorts of things. But for that, uh, but for, to know if you can do that properly, you need to have good images. So you need to have good contrast in images to make sure that you can see the difference between something that's healthy, something that's not, or something that's just not responding. So to do that, you need three things from the instrument. You need good spatial resolution, so you can locate where the line crossed uh, where the line came from. And then you need good timing resolution because this means that if you can have good timing, you know you how to pair up the pairs of events that we saw in the previous picture, and then you can throw out anything that's not at the same time, and that makes, uh, throws out noisy data. And then you need a good energy resolution. I'll get a bit more to that after, but basically this allows you to classify the detections. Is it something that interests us or not? The other part you want is sensitivity. So if you wanna wait three hours for your image, it's not gonna work well properly. You wanna get your images quickly. Um, so this is, uh, depends on the detection material, on the electronics, are they fast enough? And uh, can you get all this data after that? You want maybe wait for your image, do you want it quickly or does it matter if you wait longer? Um, but this is more for optimization, not sensitivity. So how does a detect, uh, scanner work? So there's a basic detection chain that starts from a scintillated crystal in most systems, not all, but most of them, that it, when it absorbs the gamma, it emits light. Then you have a photodetector, you get some analog front end, some electronics, and then more electronics, digital this time nowadays with data acquisition, you can do signal processing to improve the performance, and then you send it out and you make the pairs, and then it goes to the reconstruction engine. So how does it start out? Well, once the gamma comes in, it hits the atoms and gives it energy to the electrons and they slowly come back to a, a, a stable state, but that takes a little bit of time. And then along the path, they, multi they, 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 they multiply a little bit and that's how at the end you get, say about uh, 20,000 light photons. So that's not a lot. So how fast can this be? So it depends on the, uh, the crystal, the material's rise time. That means how quickly it produces light. The decay time, how long it takes for the whole thing to be produced. So the longer it takes, the more spread out the signal is. And then the, number of, the total number of photons, and then you can have an approximate timing for this. This is uh, really useful nowadays to try to compare crystals, especially for use in the time of flight uh, scanners, which I'm not gonna talk about today. The other thing is the photons do travel inside the crystal. Now, if you go back a few years, that didn't matter much. But again, nowadays, it's uh, something that we have to look into if we want to get the performance up. The second part is for the energy. Uh, why do we need this? Is because sometimes the gamma will hit the crystal and drop all its energy in one go. And that's the ones we most want to have. But sometimes it's just going to skip on it and leave only part of its energy. And then it'll maybe reach another area in the scanner, so which one hit first? We don't know. So because we know they only have partial energy, we can throw them out if we want to, or we keep them. So that can make a decision. But this will affect the quality of your image. 
It will blur it a bit, but then you have better sensitivity. So it's a trade-off of what you do. Um, so here we can see that uh, in two different crystals, for example, will have different quantities of light that are thrown out. So that's why you want to adapt uh, your read, not your readout, but how you choose which ones you want. And, um, and then you also have, as I mentioned, you have sometimes two Comptons that will hit uh, two different crystals. So you want to throw out the part that's on the left of the graph on the right. So the, 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 the scale on the bottom is how much energy an event has. And in here we have histogram about 50,000 events. So that gives us an idea of where the interesting peak is. And that's the ones you want to keep. So after the crystal, you've got the photo detector. So historically, there were many kinds. So one of the is the PMT, which is still in use today. So the advantage is that it's pretty fast and it can read many crystals. But if it reads many crystals, it has to share how fast it can see separate events. So it's good and it's not good depending on what you want to get. The disadvantage though is it's bulky and it's sensitive to magnetic fields. And what does that do? Well, you can't use it in a, a MRI. So you can't use these devices in those. That's why we can move to APD. They're immune. Um, it reads one crystal per APD, so you can get really fast count rates, but they're noisy and the timing is not so good. So how, what do we do? So lately we've been going to SIPMs, which actually gets the best of both worlds. So they're very fast. They can see very few uh, 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 photons, so they can quantify really well what comes out of the crystal. And you can make them very small and have high count rates and have uh, overall uh, good, uh, good imaging. So after these photo detectors, we have I don't know, I'll get uh, front end electronics. Um, I'm not a specialist in this, but this is a, something that can take several months to design to get the noise down and then make sure you get the ultimate best performance. So this is a, an important part of the chain that you also have. So once you have this circuit done, what it gives you out is a, is a pulse, a shape or a signal, so depending on how you, you, you format it. So in old systems, you'd only have pulses like this, and then you would simply put a logic gate. And when you have two pulses that would line up, then you would know that you had two gammas on opposite sides of your scanner. Problem is, it's, try, it's very difficult to tweak. So then we moved on to sampling systems, where we would actually record the whole shape of the signal. And then we could further process it down, get better timing, uh, get better energy. We can even get special cases in it all through, all through the processing. So this is as a step forward. And now today we have uh, what's called what I would call trigger system. With the uh, what says TZC in the middle, this is to time to digital converter. Now these are really really fast circuits that can go down to 10 picosecond and below. So this is much better than than if you go back uh, 15 years where we were in the maybe 5, 10, or even 20 nanosecond range. So this is three, four orders of magnitude better. So this is where we are today for, for the data acquisition. So what's the impact of the electronics on timing? So when we went to the crystal, we talked about the decay time, we talked about the number of photons, those impact different performances. Uh, for the electronics on the timing, well, if the electronics noisy, you won't have as good timing. That's pretty normal, um, but also, the, the shape of the, the, you can have electronics that has stronger gain, has a sharper signal, you can get, again, a better trigger. And then what happens when you do that is you, you don't only have these prompt, uh, these uh, true coincidences, you also have random coincidences. And what happens, these are like, like the name says, it's just random times when just two happen to be at the same time. So if you have bad timing, that means you have to have a wide window to make sure you gather all the true ones, but you also gather some background and you don't want that. They'll bring noise in your image. So that's why you want really good electronics. So for the energy, uh, as we spoke before, there's the Compton events, uh, the, those that are partial interactions in your crystal. And the electronics, what happens is that you don't see all the photons necessarily. You only see part of them. So the more you see, the better the energy resolution you have, and then the better you can discard the not so interesting data and keep uh, only the ones that you really want. 
Now for spatial resolution, how can you see very small uh, details? Well, this is a bit more complicated. So this, this whole equation here will guide us through that step. Well, the first thing you want is small crystals. Obviously, if you have small detectors, you'll be able to see more uh, small grained image. But then you also have the decoding factor. So how can you make sure that the crystal you think had the detection in it was the correct one? So this adds a little bit of blur. The other part is um, the, the two gammas that we see with the arrow, actually it's not exactly 180 degrees, it's slightly bended. So if you have a very large bore, then that means you lose a little bit of spatial resolution. So there's an actual limit because of that. It has nothing to do with the electronics. Another one that has to do with physics is the positron range. For example, F18, which is used in FDG, is about half a millimeter. So whatever you do, however good your electronic is, you'll never be able to go smaller than that because the positron actually moves half a millimeter away from the molecule before it even ejected the two gamma radiation. So those are the limitations for spatial resolution. So after that, just this quick review, I wanted to share a little bit of what I'm doing here at MGH. Um, and the context is that uh, there's this HRT scanner, which was made quite a few years ago, that is the reference for neural imaging. Um, the problem is it's old. And what that means, well, first of all, it's no longer sold. Uh, there, were not, there were only a few, maybe 10 or 15 of them sold. And these are starting to get out of shape. So there's a motivation to make new scanners and there's a whole bunch of people out there trying to make them or make different kinds of them to get improved spatial resolution for neuroimaging. So that's the goal. So they, some people thought, okay, well, can we scale up some small animal technology for the human brain? So the, my former group, which is in, across the border in Canada, they're building small animal uh, scanners, but they don't really go to the human scale for different reasons. Um, but then the, the, they got up with people here at MGH and say, hey, why not give us a shot? And let's see if we can build something for the brain that has really good spatial resolution and see where I can, that can get us. So again, the reason why this will work well is because these are APDs, which is old technology, true, but it's one-to-one -one coupling, which means the decoding factor is zero. So you don't have to shrink your, your crystals as much to get a high resolution. What does that mean? If you shrink them a lot, then they become harder to manufacture. They cost more, you got more losses. So this, is, this eases this part of the design. And you get good images. So these are simulations of what it would look like. So we get about 1.35 millimeter resolution in the center of the field of view. Um, it's one order of magnitude in volumetric resolution compared to the HRRT. And uh, they got a, we got a funding last year to try to build this scanner over a course of five years. So again, if we go back to the detector flow, so we've got the scintillator on the top, which is an array of four by eight crystals with an array of four by eight photo detectors. And then those go in the back of the module, like so. And then there's the front end electronics. And in this case, all the data acquisition and signal processing is actually inside this little chip, which sits behind the detector. So if I go to more specifically for my topic, um, one of the problem with these high resolutions is that whatever you tell the patient don't move for 30 minutes, it's not gonna work too well. So we need a way to correct that at the image reconstruction part. So there are several good ideas for trackless solution. What I mean is that there's no need of external device. You just put, for example, four sources on the top of the head, and then during the image reconstruction, you can track these four points and then rerun the image reconstruction, and then you can correct for the movement. Now, this works with a human scale body, so maybe three or four millimeter spatial resolution, but we don't know if this works with this high resolution kind of system. So we need to investigate that. So what I've been working on is to bring in a motion capture camera that would have a, mark, uh, a marker tool set on the top of the patient's head. And then this camera, which is on the bottom here, would be put outside the scanner 
and then we will record the information at the same time as the PET scan. And so this, this diagram is just showing how the data and the synchronization works. But basically, it's, the concept is extremely simple, um, looking at this, but there's a lot of little details to get all this working together and playing friendly to make sure that uh, all the data is aligned and then you don't miss frames and so on. So that's the gist of it. And I hope you guys enjoyed this overview talk. Thank you.